Prologue The floor of the San Diego bus station was mostly cigarette butts. A million years ago, the building had probably been fancy like Grand Central or those huge places you see in the movies. But now it just looked gray all over, like a warehouse full of cramped band flyers and windows. It was almost midnight, but the lobby was crowded. Next to me, a wall of storage lockers ran all the way down to the end. One of the lockers was leaking a little, like something had spilled inside and was dripping onto the floor. It was sticking to my shoes. There were vending machines on the other side of the lobby and there was a bar over in the corner where a bunch of skinny, stumbly men sat smoking into ashtrays, hunched over their beards like goblins. I hurried along close to the lockers, keeping my chin down and trying to not look so obvious. Back at my house when I imagined this scene, I've been pretty sure I can blend into the crowd, no problem. But now that I was here, it was harder than I pictured. I've been counting on the chaos and the size to cover me. It was a bus station after all. I didn't figure I'd be the only one here who was still too young to drive. On my street or at school, I was easy to overlook. 12 years old, an average height, average shape, average face and clothes, average everything except for my hair, which was long and red and the brightest thing about me. I yanked it into a ponytail and tried to walk like I knew where I was going. I should have brought a hat. Over at the ticket windows, a couple of older girls in green eyeshadow and rubber mini skirts were arguing with the guy behind the glass. Their hair was tense up so high it looked like cotton candy. Come on, man, said one of them. She was shaking her purse upside down in the window ledge, counting out quarters. Can't you cut me a break? I'm barely short as it is. Only a buck fifty. The guy looked sarcastic and bored in his ratty Hawaiian shirt. Does this look like a charity? No fare, no ticket. I reached into the pocket of my warm jacket and ran my fingers over my own ticket. Economy from San Diego to LA. I paid for it with 20 from my mom's jewelry box and the guy had barely looked at me. I walked faster, sticking close to the wall with my skateboard under my arm. For a second, I thought how badass it would be to set it down and go zooming between the benches, but I didn't. One wrong move and even a bunch of late night dirt bags were going to notice I wasn't supposed to be here. I was almost at the end of the lobby when a nervous ripple went through the crowd behind me. I turned around, two guys in tan uniforms were standing by the vending machines, looking out over the sea of faces. Even from across the station, I could catch the glint of their badges. Cops. The tall one had fast, pale eyes and long, skinny arms like a spider. He was pacing up and down between the benches in that way cops always do. It's a slow official walk that says I might be a creepy string bean, but I'm the one with the badge and the gun. It reminded me of my stepdad. If I could get to the end of the lobby, I could slip out to the depot where the buses pulled up. I slip into the crowd and disappear. The scuzzy guys at the bar hunch lower over their beers. One of them smashed out his cigarettes, then gave the cops a long, nasty stare and spit on the floor between his feet. The girls at the ticket window had stopped arguing with the cashier. They were acting really interested in their press on nails, but looked plenty nervous about the officer's string beings. Maybe they had the same kind of stepdads I did. The cops waded out into the middle of the lobby and were squinting around the bus station like they were looking for something. A lost kid, maybe? A bunch of delinquents up to no good. Or a runaway. I ducked my head and got ready to blend in. I was just about to step out into the terminal when someone cleared his throat and a big, heavy hand closed around my arm. I turned and looked up into the looming face of the third cop. He smiled and bored a flat smile, all teeth. Maxine Mayfield, I'm going to need you to come with me. His face was hard and 
craggy and he looked like he said the same thing to different kids about a hundred times. You've got people at home worried sick about you. Chapter 1 The sky was so low it seemed to be sitting right on top of downtown Hawkins. The world whipped past me as I clattered along the sidewalk. I skated faster, listening to the wheels whispering onto the concrete, then thudding over the cracks. It was a chilly afternoon, and the cold made my ears hurt. It had been chilly every day since we rode into town, three days ago. I kept looking up expecting to see the bright sky of San Diego, but here everything was pale and gray. And even when it wasn't overcast, the sky looked colorless. Hawkins, Indiana, home of low gray clouds and quilted jackets in winter. Home of me. Main Street was all tricked out for Halloween, with storefronts full of grinning pumpkins, fake spiderwebs, and paper skeletons were taped in the windows of the supermarket. All down the block, lamp posts were wrapped in black and orange streamers fluttering in the wind. I spent the afternoon at the Palace Arcade, playing Dick Duck until I ran out of quarters, because my mom didn't like me wasting money on video games. Back home in California, I'd mostly only gotten to play when I'd been with my dad. He'd take me to the bowling alley with him, or sometimes the laundry, which had Pac-Man and Galaga, and I sometimes hung out at Joey's Town Arcade at the mall. Even though it was a total ripoff and full of metalheads and ratty jeans and leather jackets, they had a pole position, though which was better than any other racing game that had a steering wheel like you were actually driving. The arcade in Hawkins was a big, low-roofed building with neon signs in the windows and a bright yellow awning, but under the colored lights and the paint, it was just aluminum siding. They had Dragon's Lair, Donkey Kong, Dig Dug, which was my best game. I'd been hanging out there all afternoon, running up the score on Dig Dug, but after I entered my name in the number one spot and I didn't have any more quarters, started to feel antsy, like I needed to move on. So I left the arcade and skated downtown to take a tour of Hawkins. I pushed myself faster, rattling past a diner and a hardware store, a radio shack, a movie theater. The, the theater was small, like it might have only have one screen, but the front of the grisly and old fashioned with the big marquee that struck like a battleship covered in lights. The only time I really liked to sit still was at the movies. The newest poster put out the front for the Terminator, but I'd already seen it. The story was pretty good. Still, this killer robot who looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger travels back in time from the future to kill this waitress named Sarah Connor. At first, she seemed kind of normal, but she turns out to be this total badass. I liked it. Even though it wasn't a real monster movie, but something about it also made me feel weirdly disappointed. None of the women I knew were anything like Sarah Connor. I was zipping past the pawn shop now, past a furniture store, past a piece of place with a red and green striped awning when something small and dark darted across the sidewalk in front of me. In the gray afternoon light, it looked like a cat and I just had time to think how weird it was, how you never seen a cat in a downtown San Diego. Before my feet went out from under me, I was used to wiping out, but still, that split second of a fall was always disorienting. When I lost my balance, it felt like the whole world had flipped over and skidded out from under me. I hit the ground so hard, it felt like a thumb in my teeth. I've been skating since forever, since my best friend Nate Walker and his brother Silas took a trip to Venice Beach with their parents when we were in the third grade and came back all jazzed up on stories about the Z-Boys and the skate shops in downtown. I had been skating since the day I found out about the grip tape. 
The sidewalk was cold. For a second, I lay flat on my stomach with a thumbing hollow in my chest and pain zigging up to my arms. My elbow had punched through my sleeve of my sweater and the palms of my hands felt like raw and uh, electric. The cat was long gone. I had rolled over when I was trying to sit up when a thin, dark-haired woman came hurrying out of one of the stores. It was almost as surprising as a cat in the business district. No one in California would have come running out just to see if I was okay. But this was Indiana. My mom had said people were much nicer here. The woman was already kneeling next to me on the concrete with big nervous eyes. I was bleeding a little where my elbow had gone through my sleeves. My ears were ringing. She leaned close and looking worried. Oh, your arm, that must have hurt. Then she looked up at me, staring into my face. Do you scare easily? I just stared back. No, I wanted to say. And that was true in all kinds of ways. I wasn't scared of spiders or dogs. I could walk along the boardwalk alone in the dark or skateboard in the wash and flood season and never worry that a murderer was going to jump out at me or that a sudden doge of water would come rushing down to drown me. And when my mom and my stepdad said we were moving to Indiana, I packed some socks and underwear and two pair of jeans and headed for the bus station alone to escape to LA. It was a total trip to ask a stranger if they got scared. Scared for what? For a second, I just sat in the middle of the sidewalk with my elbows stinging and my palms raw and gritty, squinting at her. What? She reached out and brushed gravel off my hands. Hers were thinner and tanner than mine, with dry, cracked knuckles and bitten fingernails. Next to them, mine looked pale, covered in freckles. She was watching me in a quick, nervous way like I was the one acting weird. I just wondered if you scare easily. Sometimes fair skin does. You know, you should put Bactine on that to keep it from getting infected. I shook my head. The palms on my hands still felt like they were full of tiny sparks. She leaned closer and I was about to say something else when suddenly her eyes got even bigger and she froze. We both looked up as the air was split by the roar of an engine. A swimming pool blue Camaro came bombing through the spotlight at Oak Street and snared up to the curb. The women whipped around to see what the trouble was, but I already knew. My stepbrother Billy was leaning back in the driver's seat with his hand damp lazily on the wheel. I could hear the blare of his music through the closed windows. Even from the sidewalk, I could see the light glinting off of Billy's earrings. He was watching me in the flat, empty way he always did. Heavy, lidded, like I made him so bored he could barely stand it. But under that was a glittering edge of something dangerous. When he looked at me like that, my face wanted to flush bright red or crumble. I was used to how he looked at me, like I was something he wanted to scrape off of him. But it always seemed worse when he did it in front of someone else, like this nice nervous woman. She looked like someone's mom. I scrubbed my stinging hands on my thighs of my jeans before bending down to get my board. He let his head flop back, his mouth open. After a second, he leaned across the seat and rode down the window. The stereo thumped louder, quiet riot pounding out into the clear chilly air. Once for two weeks back in April, I thought that the Camaro was the coolest thing I've ever seen. It had a long, hungry body like a shark, all sleep painted panels and sharp angles. It was the kind of car you could rob a bank in. Billy Hargrove was fast and hard edged like the car. He had a faded denim jacket and a face like a movie star. Back then, he wasn't Billy yet. Just this hazy idea I had about what my family life was going to be like. His dad, Neil, was going to marry my mom, and when we all moved in together, Billy was going to be my brother. I was excited to have a family again. 
After the divorce, my dad had hightailed it to LA, so mostly only saw him on second rate holidays or when he was down in San Diego from work or when he was down in San Diego for work. And my mom couldn't think up of a reason not to let me. My mom was still around, of course, but in a thin, floaty way that was hard to get a hold on. She'd always been a little blurry around the edges, but once my dad was out in the picture, it got worse. It was kind of tragic how easily she disappeared into the personality of every guy she dated. There was Donnie, who was on disability for his back and couldn't bend down to take out the trash. He made us biscuit pancakes on the weekends and told us terrible jokes. And then one day he ran off with a waitress from IHOP. After Donnie, there was Vic from St. Louis and Gus with one green eye and one blue one. And Ivan, who picked his teeth with a folding knife. Neil was different. He drove a tan Ford pickup and his shirts were iron and his mustache made him look like some kind of army sergeant or park ranger. And he wanted to marry my mom. The other guys had been losers, but they were temporary losers, so I'd never really minded them. Some of them were goofy or friendly or, or funny, but after a while, the bad stuff always piled up. They were behind on their rent, or they totaled their cars, or they'd get drunk or wind up in county. They always left, and if they didn't, my mom kicked them out. I wasn't heartbroken. Even the best ones were kind of embarrassing. None of them were cool like my dad, but mostly they, some of them were even nice. Like I said, Neil was different. She met him at a bank. She was a teller there, sitting behind a smuggy window, handing out deposit slips and giving lollipops to little kids. Neil was a guard standing all day by the double doors. He said she looked like Sleeping Beauty sitting there behind the glass or like an old timely painting in a frame. The way he said it, the idea was supposed to sound romantic, but I couldn't see how. Sleeping Beauty was in a coma. Paintings and frames weren't interesting or exciting, they were just stuck there. The first time she had him over for dinner, he brought flowers. None of the other ones had ever brought flowers. He told her that the meatloaf was the best meatloaf he's ever had and she smiled and blushed and, and glanced sideways at him. I was glad she stopped crying over her last boyfriend, a carpet salesman with a comb over and a wife he hadn't told her about. A few weeks before school let out for the summer, Neil asked my mom to marry him. He brought her a ring and she gave him the extra key to the house. He showed up when he felt like it, bringing flowers or getting rid of throw pillows, but he didn't come over after 10 and he never spent the night. He was too much of a gentleman for that. Old fashioned, he said. He liked the clean counters and family dinners. The little gold engagement ring made her happier than I, I've, I've ever seen her in a long time and I tried to be happy for her. Neil had told us he had a son in high school, but that was all he said about him. I figured he'd be some preppy football type or else maybe a younger copy of Neil. I wasn't picturing Billy. The night we finally met him, Neil took us out to Fort Fun, which was a goat cart track near my house where the surf rats went with their girlfriends to eat funnel cakes and play air hockey and skee-ball. It was the kind of place that guys like Neil would never be caught dead in. Later, I figured out he was just trying to make us think he was fun. Billy was late. Neil didn't say anything, but I, I could tell he was mad. He tried to act like everything was fine, but his fingers left dents in the foam cup. My mom fidgeted with a paper napkin while we waited, waddling it up and then tearing it into little pieces. I pretended that maybe it was all a big scam and Neil didn't even have a son. It was kind of a thing that was always happening in horror movies. The guy made up the whole fake family and told everyone about his perfect little house and his perfect little family, but actually he lived in a basement 
eating cats or, or, or something. I didn't really think it was the truth, but I imagined it anyway, because it was better than watching him glare out into the parking lot every two minutes and then smile tightly at my mom. The three of us were working our way through a game of mini golf when Billy finally showed up. We were on the 10th hole standing in front of a painted windmill the size of a garden shed and trying to get the ball past the turning snails. When the Camaro rode into the parking lot, the engine was so loud that everyone turned to look. He got out, letting the car door slam shut behind him. He had on his jacket and engineer boots and raddest of all, he had an earring. Some of the older boys at school wore boots and jean jackets, but none of them had earrings. With his mop of sprayed hair and his open shirt, it looked like the metalheads at the mall, or David Lee Roth, or s someone else famous. He came over to us, cutting straight through the mini golf course. He stepped over a big plastic turtle onto the fake green turf. Neil watched the tight, sour look he always did when something wasn't up with his standards. You're late. Billy just shrugged. He didn't look at his dad. Say hello, Maxine. I wanted to tell Billy that wasn't my name. I hate it when people called me Maxine, but I, I didn't. It wouldn't have mattered. Neil always called me that, no matter how many times I told him to stop. Billy gave me this slow, cool nod like we already knew each other, and I smiled holding my putter by its sweaty rubber handle. I was thinking how much cooler is this going to make me? How jealous Nate and Silas would be. I was getting a brother, and it was going to change my life. Later, the two of us hung out by the ski ball stalls while Neil and my mom walked down along the boardwalk together. It was getting kind of annoying how they were always all gooey at each other, but I fed quarters into the slot and tried to ignore it. She seemed really happy. Ski ball was on a raised concrete deck above the go-kart track. From the railing, you could look down and watch the cars go, zooming around in a figure eight. Billy leaned his elbows on the railing with his hands hanging loose and casual in front of him and a cigarette balanced in between his fingers. Susan seems like a real buzzkill. I shrugged. She was fussy and nervous and could be more fun sometimes, but she was my mom. Billy looked out over the track. His eyelashes were long like a girl's and I saw for the first time how heavy his eyelids were. That was the thing that I would come to learn about Billy. Though he never really looked awake, except sometimes. Sometimes his face went suddenly alert, and then you had no idea what he was going to do or what was going to happen next. So Maxine, he said my name like some kind of a joke, like it wasn't really my name. I tucked my hair behind my ears and tossed a ball into the corner cup for a hundred points. The machine under the coin slot whirled and spit out a paper chain of tickets. Don't call me that. It's Max or nothing. Billy glanced back at me. His face was slack. Then he smiled a sleepy smile. Well, you got a real mouth on you. I shrugged. It wasn't the first time I've heard that. Only when people pissed me off. He laughed and it was a low and gravely mad Max. All right. Out in the parking lot, the Camaro was sitting under a street light. So blue, it looked like a creature from another world. Some kind of monster, I wanted to touch it. Billy had turned away. He was leaning onto the rail with the cigarette in his hand, watching the go-karts as they zoomed along the tire line track. I spent the last ball clucking it into the hundred cup and took my tickets. You want to race? Billy snorted and took a drag off the cigarette. Why would I want to screw around with some little go-kart when I know how to drive? I know how to drive too, I said, even though it wasn't exactly true. My dad had taught me how to use a clutch once in a parking lot at Jack in a Box. Billy didn't even blink. He tipped his head back and blew out a puff of smoke. Sure you do, he said. 
He looked blank and bored and under the flashing neon lights, but he sounded almost friendly. I do. As soon as I'm 16, I'm going to get a Barracuda and drive it all the way up coast. Barracuda, huh? That's a lot of horsepower for a little kid. So, I can handle it. I bet I could even drive your car. Billy stepped closer and leaned down so he was staring right into my face. He smelled sharp and dangerous, like a hair stuff and cigarettes. He was still smiling. Max, he said in a sly sing-song voice, if you think you're going anywhere near my car, you are extremely mistaken. But he was smiling when he said it. He laughed again, pinching at the end of his cigarette and tossing it away. His eyes were bright, and I figured it was all a big goof, but it was just how many... And I figured it was all a big goof because it was just like how guys like to talk. The slackers and the lowlifes my dad knew, all the ones who hung out at the Black Door Lounge down the street from his apartment in East Hollywood. When they made jokes about Sam Mayfield, Daredevil's daughter, or, or teased me about the boys, they were only playing. Billy was looming over me, studying my face. You're, you're just a kid, he said once again. But I guess even kids can tell a bitch and ride when they see one, right? Sure, I said. And I'd actually been dumb enough to believe that this was the start of something good. That the Harvgroves were here to make everything better, or at, at least okay. That this was a family.